everything we have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor, for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom Welcome to the Intersection of Faith and Politics. This is Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green, and we appreciate you joining us today. As always, we want to invite you to visit today our websites at wallbuilders.com and wallbuilderslive.com. And there on wallbuilderslive.com, by the way, you can get a list of all of our stations. You can also get archives of our programs for the last few months. Just uh, visit the website there, click on the archive section. It'll pull up several months of programs. You can go back and listen to some of those Good News Fridays or interviews that are particularly interesting to you or even the Foundations of Freedom Thursday programs where we dive in deep to the founding principles. And, of course, a huge founding principle for America, a founding tenet in our Constitution and in simply our way of life, is the idea of choosing our leaders, representative form of government, this very special form of, of a Republican form of government that we have. And it often gets called into question these days when we find out that there is fraud, when we find out that uh, sometimes it's not the actual vote that is being counted. No one better on this subject in the country, as far as I'm concerned, than Catherine Engelbrecht from True the Vote. You're going to enjoy this so much today and tomorrow. She spoke to our state legislators at the Pro Family Legislators Conference just a few weeks ago, and we want to share that presentation with you. It's called True the Vote, the Power of Citizen Engagement. They did amazing things there in Houston where her organization uh, stepped up, citizens stepping up to do the job, frankly, of our government in terms of verifying that a vote is accurate and that it's true and there, that there's not fraud. And they spark something that has taken off across the nation in uh, literally, as she calls it, truing the vote. So, Catherine Engelbrecht, we're going to go to her right now at the Pro Family Legislators Conference. Here she is with our legislators. 22 states represented here. That's awesome. Thank you guys for coming all over for uh, the Texas winter. This is freezing cold here. Um, so, if you, as, as David said, uh, my name is Catherine Engelbrecht. I... Um, it still amazes me that I'm, I'm so privileged to be able to stand before such a, an esteemed body yourselves and talk about something that just a few years ago I would have never imagined I would have been a part of. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about True the Vote. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey in these last few years. Uh, but I'd also really like to talk about solutions because all of you as legislators are in a, um, you're in an incredibly important role in the lives of our states and in our country. And I think we find ourselves now together at a, at a seminal moment in our country's history where we are either as a, as a, as a culture going to tip back towards liberty or, or forward in, into complete chaos. And so um, I'd like to spend some time, uh, quality time, at, uh, taking your questions and talking very specifically about, I think, things that we can do to improve the overall state of our elections. But before we go down that road, let me tell you how I got uh, on the road at all. Um, I, in 2009, um, after about 16 years of running an oil field services company and uh, taking care of both my parents who were ailing at the time and uh, being very engaged in my children's school and helping found a church and, and being all together, I, I, I considered myself kind of a life activist. And I noticed increasingly that everywhere I turned government had its tentacles. There were, there were regulations that were putting a stranglehold on the energy sector in which I was trying to make my livelihood. I, I, I saw um, government programs finding their way into my children's curriculum. I, I didn't quite know what to do about it, but I thought that um, certainly there had to be a way that citizens could get involved and make a difference. And it was about that time that, that the Tea Party just sort of birthed onto the scene and, um, you know, I know I'm, I'm in a room of believers, and I'll share with you, I, there is nothing but the hand of God that explains how some now five years ago, out of nowhere, with, with no advanced marketing, no billions spent in social networking or websites or T-shirts or anything that, that can influence culture, um, all of a sudden people 
across the country found that they had a voice and they wanted to get engaged. Well, I was one of those folks. I didn't know quite what to do. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to do something that would make a, a sustainable, lasting, positive contribution. And so um, I'd heard that there was a need for people to go and work at the polls. I thought, well, I can go do that. That's simple. That'll be a one-day gig. I'll go work, and then I'll check that off my good citizen list and move on to something else. And what happened when, um, when I went with a very small group of folks in, in Harris County, which Harris County is Houston, third largest voting block in the nation, so it's a very significant. We, ha we have over a thousand precincts or a thousand polling places in that county. We have roughly uh, four million plus or minus uh, voting population. So it's, it's, a, it's a big place. Well, we started to go to work and what we saw um, threw us for a loop. We saw people who would come in with multiple registration cards, and when presenting the first one and being told, oh, I'm sorry, sir, you've already voted with that one, well, they'd pull the other one out. Oh, well, that's fine. You can go vote. We'd see people who would come in and be prepared to sign in the polling book and get to their name, and, and there somebody else had already signed their name. It wasn't in their handwriting, of course, but nonetheless, their vote had been stolen. Uh, and what we saw more often, and frankly what we still see a lot today, people who will come in and just sort of sheepishly whisper, I don't remember who I'm supposed to vote for. <laughs> this is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Christians have always believed that the greatest life-changing experience available to any individual is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and the testimonies of numerous converts confirm the dramatic changes which often accompany salvation. One such testimony of change comes from founding father Noah Webster, who explained, I was led by a spontaneous impulse to repentance, prayer, and entire submission and surrender of myself to my Maker and Redeemer. I now began to understand and relish many parts of the scriptures which before appeared mysterious and unintelligible. In short, my view of the scriptures, of religion, of the whole Christian scheme of salvation, and of God's moral government are very much changed. The power of God to change a life yielded to Him was just as evident at the time of the Founding Fathers as it still is today. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. And then the election judge will say, oh, I can help you with that. You'll hear him, you'll go to, watch him go to the voting booth, and you'll hear the election judge or, or the, the worker there instruct the voter not just in how to operate the machine, because please don't misunderstand. There's absolute legitimate reasons. If you're a voter and you, have, you need help, that's, that's absolutely appropriate. But there's a difference between understanding how to push the buttons and understanding who the election judge wants you to vote for or whether or not they want you to vote straight party. And we would hear the, the, the judge say, put your hand on mine and we're going to turn three clicks to the left and four clicks to the right. And what, I mean, now when you saw this in 2009, um, we just kind of slack jawed about the whole thing. Just, you know, we'd all kind of just come out of our county training and watch these things happen. And they were happening in just the, they happened in the blink of an eye. And you just, you, you see it all unfold and you think, what, I, I think that's, I think that's illegal. I don't think you're supposed to be able to do that. But it's, it happens and it's over and it's done with. Well, we all got back then the next few days after the election of 2009 and we compared notes. Now please hear me when I say this because it's, it's very important that you understand. I am not standing before you today telling you that, um, our, our, our nation's elections are, have, have fallen off a cliff. They're close, but they haven't fallen off a cliff yet. Um, Certainly in 2009 when we got back together, 80 some percent of our, of our little group had wonderful, wonderful experiences. Those kinds of experiences that, that made you, you know, proud to be an American, proud to serve. Were there process problems? Were they shorthanded? Yeah, that's, that was without fail the case. But there were this handful that came back and said, here are the kinds of things we saw, the kinds of things that I just described to you. And the thing that was so unnerving about it was that the stories were so eerily similar. And that when they saw these things happen, more than one of them were told, what are you going to do about it? It's my word against yours. 
And when you, when you hear things like that, when you see things like that, it's, it's hard to move on past it. Because ladies and gentlemen, everything else we're going to talk about the, the course of this weekend, every, all the big issues that we face in our nation, most all of them presuppose a free and fair election is at the underpinning. That those that are sent to office to represent us have gotten there because it's the true voice of the people with the mandate of the people. If the fundamental process by which we, we govern, by which we, we determine the direction of our country, if that is hoax, if that's a fraud, if that's a facade, um, then, then what really are we? So we were left to kind of grapple with that question, and we decided, you know, rather than just wring our hands and say, boy, we hope somebody does something about it, um, we decided that to not do something would make us accomplices, I guess, in a way, um, complicit. So was born True the Vote. True the Vote was then um, in Harris County in 2010, uh, launched not really ever anticipating that we'd grow to become a national organization, really just trying to deconstruct from soup to nuts the election process. How did it, we'd, so we'd seen the product of bad data inside the polls and, and the effect that that had. So how do you make sure that the data that gets into your poll books is good? And then f from that place, how do you make sure that the polling process makes sense? And then after you have your experiences at the polls, how are you making sure that that all those votes that were cast are being properly counted and accounted for. And, and measuring all along the way to make sure that uh, when there's calls for common sense election code reform, that, that you have the, the metrics, that you have the empirical evidence there to support your reasoning about why it needs to change to begin with. So we set, we set in motion this, this very, what we thought was going to be this very sort of compartmentalized process that would help Harris County elections for a season, and then we would straighten that up and then we'd move on to something else. Um, again, never anticipating that it would lead to where it did. We began by looking at, in Harris County, uh, you know, you can, and most of you know this because you've just come out of your own campaigns, you can go and buy your county or your state voter files for oftentimes very little money. In Harris County, you could get a, a, voter, a voter file disk of some four million records for 20 bucks. So we went, we bought the disk, and we, we set it up on Excel spreadsheets, and we began to sort by um, households that have six or more people living in them registered to vote in that same household address. Now, note, there is nothing wrong with having six or more people registered in a household, but at some point, you know, when you get to not maybe six, but 60 or 600, at some point, you got to start asking the questions. And so we began with this data analysis project, and as we did that, a group came into town called Houston Votes. Houston Votes um, was making headlines because they said that they were going to get hundreds of thousands of new voters registered in the matter of just a couple of months. Now, quick show of hands in this room. How many of you have ever registered voters? And I'm sure most of you have. Okay. Can you even imagine registering hundreds of thousands of voters in a month or so? We couldn't either. I mean, at the time, we were, you know, we were putting up our little tables outside of gun shows, which we thought was brilliant. No one has ever thought of doing that before. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, the end of an 8, 12-hour day, you've gotten a couple dozen new voters registered, and then you read this in the headlines about the 100,000. So we thought, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We are going to file open records requests, and we are going to ask to see every registration that this group is turning in. And then we're going to ask to see every registration that falls outside of norm. In other words, every registration that was turned in outside of the five-day business day uh, turnover period that you have in Texas, where you have to, from the time you take it to the time you turn it in, you have, you, we used to have five days. We want to see everything that fell outside of that. We want to see every application where the name that was written at the top and the signature at the bottom didn't match. We want to see every application where they had checked, I am not a citizen, and then still went on to register to vote. And frighteningly, you can submit open records requests for those kinds of things, and you will get those, those documents returned back to you. And there were those that filled in every category. We had non-citizens who'd been registered. We had names that didn't match. The theory was... We want to be able to run the numbers and see if, in fact, this group who is just potentially milling through registrations um, 
might be doing so intentionally, intentionally to bloat the roles, to cause chaos. And if so, then maybe we could begin to track those, those trends and, and turn over those patterns to the county, then the county surely would put a stop to it. If, however, that wasn't the case and they were in fact registered, maybe they had, you know, maybe, maybe they did know something we didn't. Maybe they knew how to register people. Maybe we could learn a lesson. Maybe they had found a, a lost civilization that we needed to know about. That'd be fantastic. But if not, we wanted the county to know it. So anyway, we started, we started our work. Well, lo and behold, as you heard David say, we, we found some pretty troubling information. Hey, this is Tim Barton with Wall Builders. And as you've had the opportunity to listen to Wall Builders Live, you've probably heard the wealth of information about our nation, about our spiritual heritage, about the religious liberties, about all the things that makes America exceptional. And you might be thinking, as incredible as this information is, I wish there was a way that I could get one of the Wall Builders guys to come to my area and share with my group, whether it be a church, whether it be a Christian school or public school or some political event or activity. If you're interested in having a Wall Builder speaker come to your area, you can get on our website at www.wallbuilders.com and there's a tab for scheduling and if you'll click on that tab you'll notice there's a list of information from speakers bios to events that are already going on and there's a section where you can request an event to bring this information about who we are where we came from our religious liberties and freedoms go to the wall builders website and bring a speaker to your area We found thousands of applications where, in fact, uh, the names didn't match. That the name at the top of the application started out as Adam Smith, and by the time they got to the bottom, it was John Doe. Uh, we, we found signatures that, um, I'll tell you what, we, we, we built, this was all volunteer, and we built volunteer uh, teams of what we found to be the best possible handwriting experts, retired teachers, because they know cheaters. And they could find that you could put a stack, you could put 10 stacks, and they'd say, I saw that somebody wrote a J with like a three in the center in that stack 400 applications ago, and I just found another one. And they could spot them. Well, we were beginning to match all this stuff up, turning it in. Well, it made headlines. Um, it made headlines to the point that the Harris County tax assessor collector, which is who runs the elections in Harris County, came forward in a press conference. And they he laid it down the law and he said, we're not going to have these acorn-type operatives operating in Harris County. We're going to put an end to it. That happened on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Just a few days later, we were, uh, our little group was in Washington at a Glenn Beck rally. And we heard that there was a counter press conference that had been called by Houston Votes. They had they had intended to call a, a press conference to essentially disparage our work. Well, we were in New, uh, in Washington, so of course we then had to call a remote counter counter press conference to refute the things that were going to be said about us. Well, that was all happening on a Saturday morning. Um, that morning, just a few hours before those press conferences were to start, and only a few days after this this find had been revealed. All of Harris County's election equipment was burnt to the ground. And for those of you that are from Texas, you may remember that. It was 10,000 machines, about $30 million worth of equipment and collateral material. Um, the, the cause of the fire has never been proven. Uh, I am not going to tell you that it was, in fact, foul play. I will tell you, though, that the timing is very circumspect. Um, that, though sent into motion a, a, a series of events that I could have never, you, you, you cannot write what happened next. Because here I was in Washington with my, with my kiddos who I had taken out of, of school, wanting them to see a part of this great uprising of liberty and, and you know, like that, like every good parent does when they're running out of time on a short-lived vacation, I was dragging them from landmark to landmark as fast as I possibly could. <laughs> And we were racing up the steps to the Lincoln Memorial, and my phone rang. It was a number that I didn't realize or recognize. I let it go to voicemail. And it turns out it was the editor of the Huffington Post. Yeah, not so good. And um, 
And I thought, well, before I call him back, because I had no experience with the press whatsoever, and so I, I thought, well, before I call him back, I'm just going to go and see if anything had been written. Um, sure enough, to my great amazement, a story had already been published without ever talking to me uh, about this fire uh, linking True the Vote to the arson, me as an arsonist, and calling True the Vote the largest voter suppression effort ever in the history of the country. Exactly. Wow. How did we go from, I think I'm going to go work at the polls one day, to that? <laughs> right? And it's like a dog whistle went off, and all of a sudden, we were pro-liberty non grata to the, the leftist radical arm of, of the political blogosphere. And um, yet again, we were faced with a decision. Do we back down and, and stop and just say, wow, that is, it is too hot in that kitchen and I'm out? Or do we stand our ground? Well, I decided it'd be better to go ahead and stand my ground so that I could look my children in the face and hope that they would have an opportunity for liberty when they grow up. And, um, <laughs> no, thanks. Um, but, but from that point, ladies and gentlemen, um, not only did the Huffington Post take an interest, but the federal government took an interest as well. And in, from January of 2011 through to the latter part of 2013, over, over that two-year two and some odd month period, we had, uh, to, to date, 25 either audits or investigations or inquiries into my personal life or into the, into the operations of True the Vote by the IRS, by Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, by OSHA, by the FBI, by the, the Texas branch of the EPA. Um, the, the, only, the only thing, it, it, despite all the stories that I've just kind of laid out to you, the only thing that really changed that should have put us on that particular radar was that we filed paperwork for our nonprofit status. We wanted to be a 501c3 so that if people decided that they wanted to, to donate money, we would be able to do that officially. Well, from the moment, almost, that that, that, that paperwork was filed, uh, we began to be, be, um, be harassed. Uh, the FBI began to show up at um, our, our meetings, which were open to the public. Uh, come to find out later on, they showed up over five or six times inquiring about different people that came to the meetings and whatnot. Uh, come to find out, after this was all said and done, and we filed FOIAs to try to understand what it was that the FBI was actually after. What does our file actually say? When you look at the FBI, this is kind of funny, when you, just, it's actually funny that I think these things are funny. When you look at the FBI file, it says that the domestic terrorism unit came, which is with the group that came out, uh, came to us on repeated occasions in the interest of community outreach. Oh, isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you, FBI, for that. Bringing a fruit basket, the domestic terrorism unit. So, so the FBI came out. We had the IRS come out on several occasions. <laughs> Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms came out on two occasions, um, both uh, under the auspices of coming to do an investigation because we did have a firearms license to manufacture gun parts, which we've never done. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about through the vote. I'm talking about back in my real life when I used to have one with Engelbrecht Manufacturing making, gun, uh, making oil field parts. Right after the Obama administration put a moratorium on, deep, on offshore drilling and we saw the spigots just kind of turn off, we thought, well, we better diversify somehow. So we got this license. We never made the parts, which they very clearly knew because you have to file report after report that shows what you're making or not. Nonetheless, they show up. You have to open your... Your, your safes, they made you take out all the guns, you have, they write down all your serial numbers, it's just like your worst nightmare. Meanwhile, the nonprofit status paperwork continued to churn, and I was being asked questions related to that nonprofit applications, questions like, we want to know every Facebook posting you've ever posted, we want to know every tweet you've ever tweeted, we want to know everywhere you've ever spoken since the inception of the organization, and to whom, and what you said, and where you intend to speak for the next year. Yeah. Uh, before it was all said and done, I think we answered about three, 300 plus or minus questions related to the nonprofit application. But it was when Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms came out the second time to my private business that I called our attorney and said, 
that's it. The gloves are off. Who can we sue and how fast can we sue them? And that's when we sued the IRS, which was in May of 2013. May, May of, well, thank you. It's, think about the things that get applause nowadays. Wow. That's when we sued the IRS. So we sued the IRS in 2013, and it was just a month or so now ago, maybe three weeks ago, that a federal court judge, after being in court all this time, it was, the, the IRS immediately su uh, moved to dismiss the suit. And there were several counts in, inside of our suit. The first was, we want to know if we're a 501c3 or not. You know, most, at, most organizations get that determination within four to six months of having filed that application. We were in on three plus years, and we were still asking questions, being, being asked to answer questions. Now, what's important about that, when you think about it, is people can be quick to say, oh, well, you know, maybe they had reason to, to question whether or not you should be classified as a nonprofit. And you know what? That's fair. If they didn't think that we met the criteria, so be it. Deny our application. But they didn't. They kept spinning and spinning and spinning through the 2012 election cycle, asking more and more and more questions. And when the big scandal finally broke, we came to understand, just by virtue of being in a place to, to be on the receiving end of a lot of this stuff, that other organizations were being asked about their affiliation with us. All right, friends, we're out of time for today. That was Catherine Ingelbrecht speaking on the subject of true the vote, making sure we get rid of fraud and, uh, and that the vote that the citizens cast is the vote that is counted and that we actually get the right people uh, elected based on what the voters decided, not based on what someone was able to fraudulently produce. We're going to pick up where we left off today with our program tomorrow. So this is a two-part series with Catherine. She was with us at the Pro-Family Legislators Conference just a few weeks ago. If you missed the opening of today's program, uh, tomorrow we will get the conclusion, so don't miss tomorrow with Catherine Engelbrick at the Pro Family Legislators Conference. You've been listening to Wobblers Live. We stand on this.